Um, that's it. That's that's the intro. It's just my cat because I didn't know what to do. Say hi, Felix. He loves me. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jordan here, the PH is silent, and uh, we're gonna talk about two things today. One is language, and the other is cosmology. And language doesn't really fit in with uh, the campaign setting that we're making, because this is more of the novel exercise. Uh, but cosmology is gonna be really interesting. So I'm gonna answer some of your questions about the various uh, classes you can play. And specifically, a lot of you have been asking, where do sorcerers fit into Endegar? So let's go talk about all that stuff. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, day nine of Endegar world building. We're gonna jump right into it. Um, so today's, uh, today is, is about language. Um, our uh, webwriter.net fantasy novel creation thing that we're using for our tabletop RPG fantasy setting. Um, it really wants you to talk about language and finding the right feel for the languages. Um, this is this is not something we want to do. So um, specifically because we are a tabletop, I'm I'm not creating a setting that is, I don't know, like a whole, I, I want to create a setting for D&D. So those characters in D&D are going to use the languages provided with Dungeons and Dragons. And I could spend some time and come up with a new language, maybe for the ancient goblins. Um, but that's not the focus I want to do right now. So instead, I'm going to answer some questions that uh, you, the you guys, the viewers, have have been... Oh, I'm, I'm getting pinged. So uh, I'm going to answer some questions that you guys, the viewers, have been uh, addressing to me. So clicking this link brings us to um, a sub part of uh, webwriter.net for Magical World Builders Guide. Um, and so this is uh, in addition to the 30 days of world building. Uh, and I wanted to, to go over this a little bit, um, but basic world building, magic levels is something that we have been talking about a little bit. Is it magic rich? Is there like the one wizard? Is it kind of things like that? How many magical creatures are you have? Um, goblins and gremlins, elves, fairies, dragons, magical cataclysms. We've kind of talked about that as well. Um, and then this is something that I wanted to address. So the different types of magic. Uh, we have, D&D &D is a very strong Vancey in magic, uh, although augmented, mutated maybe from its original form uh, with 1977 D&D. &D. Uh, so... Let's check this out. Um, the magic systems that they talk about in here, um, the, there, there is the classic magic, um, which is a manipulation of a mystical energy which is unexplained and unexplainable. Um, and this energy might be the force. Uh, it might be uh, nature. Uh, it might be names or rituals, music or something like that. Uh, this kind of magic is characterized by spells, which are basically the exercise used by wizards to manipulate that energy. So this is the weave in the Forgotten Realms. It's there, it's all around us. Uh, you just need to know how to interact with it to do magical things. Um, second type of magic is divine. These are uh, miracles and, and you know healing the sick and things like that. So basically, before we had our wizards, now we're talking about our clerics or our priests. Uh, I've been I've been studying a lot of um, different cam not campaign settings, different uh, game settings entirely, and uh, it's interesting because a game like Dungeons and Dragons that uses like spell slots and things like that, it's very, uh, for lack of a better word, fancy and magic, but. Uh, having those magical spells in your head and then casting them and losing them, the magic is almost like a, a, a living thing that you're taming or controlling in a way. At least that's how it was with Jack Vance's novels. And then you have settings like Hogwarts where uh, magic just seems to be an unending supply of really cool things that you can do. And uh, I feel like that's reflected in, I just bought Kids with Brooms, Kids on Brooms, which is a... Uh, kind of a Harry Potter-esque version of Kids on Bikes. And it's really fun, but it is like you can just cast spells. Like there's no, 
there's no give to spell casting. There's no recharge. It's just kind of like, I mean, you might have a spell duel where you have to like really focus and concentrate, but for the most part, you're not, you're not draining yourself by casting magic uh, that often. And then um, I was reading about uh, Invisible Sun by Monty Cook Games. Every character class has a different way of interpreting magic. And in that game, everybody's a wizard. And it was a big inspiration for me on this campaign setting in the sense of um, the, the world and the various planes of existence, the cosmology that uh, Invisible Sun has. It's really cool. So classes, yeah. So I made, um, this is a, a mime that I'm working on. But here are the class, whoa, that is not what I wanted to do. Here are the classes that are in 5th edition D&D. And I went through and I tried to understand how these would fit into Endegar. So Barbarian, you're a brute force attacker. You don't necessarily need to be from a tribe or from the whatever, but like just a, a just force. Like you are, you are not um, elegant. You are, you are brutish. Um, bard and bardic magic, uh, we'll get into this when we talk about the planes of existence, but underlying instead of instead of having a weave and things like that underneath endegar and i say underneath but like the the magical energy that flows in everything um i want it to deal with vibrations and so if a wizard can study 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 and understand like the concept of and I guess we'll use music for lack of a better word, but like they can understand the concept of music and that if I hit this, it makes this tone and it does this. And then you have other people where they just kind of pick up a guitar and they're like, oh yeah, oh, that sounds good. And they just have an innate talent for it. Both people are getting to a similar, um, they're both on a similar path, but it, or so they're both getting to a same destination, but through different paths. Bardic magic, uh, I think it comes from divine means. I think the, the gods bless you, but bards don't necessarily understand that they are blessed. Um, and they're natural. They just seem to have a, a, a knack for understanding the vibrations of the universe. universe. And this is going to be um, kind of referenced in a magic item, or maybe just they'll call it the Har Harmonices Mundi. Um, and this is uh, an actual piece of... Um, work that uh, Kepler, uh, and it's called The Harmony of the World, is what this translates into. And it's just that all of the spheres that we were talking about earlier and the movements of celestial bodies and all of this actually form some kind of music. And there's, it's not audible, but there's a mathematical harmony to it. And understanding that gives you insight into the world around you. Um, cleric, clerics are going to be forbidden in many cities. Um, because it's forbidden to worship uh, the gods. You need to worship um, the, the four that, you know, you need to follow the, the quadrivium and things like that because uh, creatures like Asmodeus are going to give you more power than, uh, than worshiping those, those gods that don't talk to you. They don't even have physical forms. How do you know they exist kind of a thing? Uh, that is what the, the enemy will tell us. Now, uh, Clerics are rare because anyone can worship a god, but just because you worship a god doesn't mean you receive their blessing. So uh, there are those that believe in the gods, but it is rare to see the gods working through an individual. So if you are a cleric of a specific god, or you know that this god is working through you, you are very special. And I, I, I think that that's turning the, the tide on or, t or flipping the coin or something, whatever I want to say. I don't have a good word for it. But where warlocks might be in Forgotten Realms, for example, warlocks might be like, ooh, I don't know about that. But clerics are like, oh, yeah, you worship so-and-so. Like, you, you're able to heal me. I'll just go to the local cleric in town and get a, a you know, resurrect my friend. Um, that's not necessarily possible with uh, Endegar, because you're not finding a lot of clerics, and if somebody has that power, they're probably keeping it safe. And we'll talk a little bit later about good and evil, but you potentially you could be an evil cleric. You're just you're just blessed by the gods for some reason. You know, uh, druids are uh, nature magic creatures. Uh, they're hermits. They they practice an old form of magic that that draws from nature. 
Um, so druids aren't found in cities very much. Uh, and that nature pulling is part of understanding the harmonics, but like the harmonics that they're interpreting is the way the wind goes through the trees and how to ask the, the, the earth to help you with vines and how to, how to really become a bear. Um, and so that's why it's a little different. They're all getting to the same place. They're getting to a magical location, but uh, from different, different paths. Uh, and so druid is nature magic, which is a divine type of magic. Uh, and that being said, I would like a druid that cast cure wounds. I want that to look a really different from a cleric that cast cure wounds because they're both, you're both healing hit points, but it's not essentially the same spell because you're a different class. Um, a fighter is a typical fighter. You're a soldier, you're a gladiator. Uh, you're, you're just, you know, you're a fighter. Um, monks. So this was a hard one and I almost wanted to just be like, I don't want monks in my game, but that's not fair because if it's in the core rule book for 5e, we really should have a place for it. Um, monks are secretly devoted to a deity uh, and just how a cleric can, can bestow uh, or a god can bestow powers on a cleric, um, monks do the same thing, but they're approached from a different way. And so... Uh, it's not the type of god you worship, but it's how you worship, if that makes sense. Um, Paladin is uh, a holy knight, so it's just you're a fighter, but you have a divine side, and you're also devoted to a specific deity, maybe in secret, and you're getting a little bit of divine power to help. These are rare, I want to say that. So so monks might be less rare because they, are, uh, they can do it in secret. Um, druids are not going to be found in cities very often. Uh, clerics are going to be very rare, and paladins are going to be very rare. Uh, that doesn't mean that a player can't play them, but if a player chooses to be a paladin, they need to understand that they might be, like, there's no, there's no church for them to go to. There's no order of this. Like, they are uh, very isolated in their communication with their god, probably, and with their, uh, just, they're not a lot of paladins, um, so that you're alone in that sense. Um, Ranger is kind of, uh, I liked it, a protector of the forest. Um, I, I kind of think of Rangers as the druid paladin. So they understand magic on a certain sense, uh, but they're also very um, nature y and, and can manipulate magic a little bit. They don't understand it on the scale of a druid, uh, but they, they know how to fight. And so they're, they're the nature fighter. And I know Ranger has a lot of problems with 5e, but yeah. Uh, rogue, a thief, a trickster. Uh, this this needs work, which I should probably make it orange. So I know that it'll work on it. Um, sorcerers, and we're gonna figure this out tonight. Uh, they could have some kind of magical pact. It could have magical blood in their history. It could have been radiated by magic somehow, gaining powers, blessed by a dragon, or touched by the elemental planes. So we know that there are different planes. There's elemental planes and things like that. Um, and sorcerers, kind of like bards, just have an innate understanding of uh, the world around them. So looking at 5e sorcerers and the different packs that you get, um, I like that you could be blessed by a dragon um, and maybe a dragon, may the dragon, so maybe like the dragon blessed you um, or you grew up next to the underground skeleton of an old dragon and that radiated magic into your body and now you are 14 and your mutant powers have activated and you're going to go save the world. Um, because we're kind of observing magic as a, or, or utilizing magic is through vibrations, um, perhaps sorcerers are your body is slightly out of phase with the regular world, and that allows you to be in phase with the magical world. Um, to the same extent that uh, fiends, celestials, uh, certain fey, just magical creatures, we call them magical creatures because they are out of phase of the regular world and more in phase with a magical world. So I view sorcerers as being kind of a, a foot in both places. Um, and if you, well, let's just look up some sorcerers quick. Um, so, okay. So let's just look at a, a couple of sorcerers and we'll just go through. So, um, aberrant mind, 
um, an alien influence giving you psionic power. This could be uh, having a foot on the material plane, but you're also, you know, something happened that you have a foot in the far realm. And so you're, there's a part of you that's just kind of, uh, you've never really fit in socially, um, and you have these weird powers that kind of manifest at some point. And I think that perhaps that just happens. Perhaps uh, you're Neo and you're the one, and there's a mathematical anomaly that the architect can't uh, figure out, and so we get random sorcerers. Uh, Clockwork Sorcerer, uh, your powers arise from Mechanus. Um, we don't necessarily have a Mechanus, but like we could, we could factor this into uh, kind of a, a law, maybe. Um, so if we wanted, you know, like chaos, neutrality, law, if you're a law sorcerer, so you're very focused on on that side of it and order and, and kind of... So you're focused on that side of it and like order and, and how you do things. Um, Divine soul is perhaps not blessed by a god, but uh, you have a foot in the upper planes. So there's a part of it that that feels like home to you. Uh, Draconic bloodline, we talked about that. This is kind of difficult because I'm only going to have the one dragon, but I feel his presence could be overwhelming in the world. And if that is the case, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe we could do that. Or this could also be a, a fey sorcerer. Like maybe there are more dragons in the fey wild that are smaller. Um, and you have a foot there. Shadow magic, I think you have a foot in the... Uh, we could say the ethereal, but also just the uh, the the shadow, you know, the the other realm, uh, the shadow fell. Uh, storm sorcery, I would flavor this as more of like a elemental mage, maybe like you're you're connected to a, a certain um, element or uh, the vibrations of weather, like what causes weather. Um, is very complex and you have a, 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 and a knack for that. And then wild magic is like, we don't really know what's happening. Like lots of weird stuff's going on. We could do that. Uh, we'll see. And with that, I'll change that. So I wrote, uh, they have a vibrational uh, harmonices Monday connection to another plane of existence or a magical force that works on the prime material plane in some way. Um, Warlock is the main source of magic for humans specifically, but all creatures could do that. Um, and warlock knights rule most of the major human cities. Uh, wizard has a mathematical understanding of magic. They are allowed to practice, but under supervision, supervision from the quadrivium. They use their magic mostly to craft items for pact keepers, unless they are like a secret wizard not wanting to be run by the quadrivium. Um, and then artificer, uh, like it just works out perfectly for gnomes. Um, we have this understanding that wizards are using magic to uh, to to craft items with it, um, whereas a wizard would focus more on the mathematics of the spells themselves. I feel like an artificer would be, I could take this tuning fork that understands the vibrations of a lightning bolt and I could put it inside a glove and now that glove can cast Shocking Grasp. And so their understanding of magic is more on a, on a tinkery level, I guess. So I hope I answered your question about sorcerers. Uh, we're going to do another deep dive into uh, the cosmology of the world. Are there other planes? So I'll click here, the planes. Um, there, there are other planes. Um, and I want there to be similar planes to what is established in Planescape. Uh, because the Great Wheel cosmology is just really cool. And I talked a little bit about it, but I, I'm trying to use this Mysterium Cosmographicum, which is um, a heliocentric universe, um, starting with an octahedron, and so we'll do a D8, uh, a D20, um, a D12, a D4, and a D6. And you have the uh, octahedron and then it's wrapped in a sphere. And then within that sphere is the icosahedron wrapped in a sphere. And then within that or around that sphere is the dodecahedron and it goes out and out and out. So with this uh, cosmology, we have the world below the ethereal plane with the octahedron. We have the icosahedron, which is Endegar. We have the dodecahedron, which is the world above the astral plane. 
Um, and I'm still, I don't know if I want a Sigil, uh, a Taurus, so we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, the Tetrahedron is going to be Hyperborea, and that is where the souls of the dead go. And I was thinking about this today. I'm not, I'm not sold on the name Hyperborea, even though it's, uh, it is Greek. Uh, hi, yeah, I gotta, I don't know. I might, I'm probably going to change that. I just don't know what that is going to be, but basically heaven. Um, so the dodecahedron, the astral plane, the world above, basic, and I say the world above because the ethereal plane, the far realm is like the world below. Um, but the dodecahedron, if you don't go to Hyperborea, if you don't go to heaven to become, I don't know, to hang out with the, get as close to the gods as you possibly can, then you're probably going to be stuck in, uh, the astral plane and you never do that full passing on to uh, where mortal souls are supposed to go. Now, magical creatures such as fiends and things like that, they're, they're to remain in the astral plane. They are not allowed to go to Hyperborea. Um, that is where they belong, but they are different creatures from mortals. And mortals uh, have this path, this journey they go on. Um, and so there's not a hell so much as there are the, we have the, the upper planes and lower planes in the Great Wheel cosmology, and uh, there's, not, there's not a hell in the sense of Hyperborea and like Hades, uh, there's just Hyperborea, but you could be stuck on the astral plane and you're trapped in the Nine Hells or Gehenna or Hades or the Abyss or something like that. So if you make those choices, that is probably where you will Okay, so I just wrote quickly that the astral plane holds the four elemental planes as well as the positive and negative energy plane. Um, I should say uh, this is uh, along with the um, rest of the outer planes. So maybe that location where they fought, maybe that is the center. And that's why it's this neutrality place um, in the astral plane, and maybe that's the Outlands in my world, and I'm not going to call them the Outlands, and maybe it'll be like a a vast desert or something. I kind of like that idea. And perhaps Sigil could still be there, or maybe I'll just have an, an interesting, I don't know, like an, an old man that sits there, and he'll direct you to one of the three doors that will take you somewhere. That could be fun. Um, but yeah, this is just a really, this is just a really cool photo of uh, what Kepler thought the universe was like. He thought that all of these uh, things were just like Russian doll nested within each other. And that was the universe. And uh, the big one is uh, the dodecahedron was the stars above us, you know? And we, he felt that because of the planetary rotations, if you extrapolated the math on this, let's take an octahedron, wrap it in a circle, place an icosahedron around that, wrap it in a circle. If you do that, um, then, and I should say a sphere, but if you do that, a lot of the planets uh, that we knew of back in the day, um, back in the 1600s, uh, they mathematically oddly lined up. So this is a, a flawed system of our current understanding of uh, the space and, you know, planetary uh, motion, but that's just some really cool art. And I love the idea that maybe uh, this, this isn't about physical space because physical space is 3D space, but if you start thinking in a fourth dimension, so anyway, I like that. Um, if you want to know more about this and the Mysterium Cosmographicum, I'll link a couple of YouTube videos. Uh, Vsauce has one. That's where I got this logo. Uh, he has this on a shirt. And this is just a 2D representation of the platonic solids uh, connecting to each other. Um, really cool shirt. Another reason that I think this is really fun is somebody in, somebody in the comments of one of my videos said, uh, you're making the world a D20. I see what you're doing there. And... I'm not trying to hide that. I'm not trying to be like, oh, you discovered my secret. I'm so clever. Like that's very blatantly what I'm going to, what I want to do. I, I just like that image and the idea that we're all playing this game with these 
platonic solid dice minus the d10. And that connects you to the setting. I mean, does that make sense? Is that is that dumb? It probably is. But in my mind, I think it's really cool. And I'm excited to uh, play around with that idea. So I think one of my goals with this game is we have associations with the dice that we roll. Um, like daggers or d4s, you know. Uh, great axe is a d12. Like we understand that this bigger heavy weapon is a d12 and that is just stronger than this. I thought it would be fun to create a, a campaign setting that made the player look at dice in a different way. Instead of the numbers, you know, like one to 12 on a, on a d12, that's more damage than one to four on a d4. You're not thinking of the shape of the dice. You're thinking of the numbers of the dice. And this campaign setting, when we start getting into the, the cosm, cosm, cosmography, uh, the Mysterium Cosmographicum specifically, that you have a new association with your dice. Um, because, I don't know, now, now that D4 is not just a dagger. It's not just, oh, yeah, I threw a dart. It does the D4 damage. Now that D4 is like, well, that's where, that's the visual representation of heaven, you know? And uh, the D8 is the visual representation of the ethereal plane. And it's like, well, what does that mean? What is, why a D8? And, and, and I think the players can ask a lot of really cool questions. And you at the table can figure it out together, you know? And the icosahedron, that's Endegar. Planet is literally a D20. What does that mean? Why? Is it important? I think the, the fun of it is that they're looking at the world in a different way. Um, the campaign setting, they're looking at the campaign setting a different way and they're looking at their dice in a new way. So that's my goal. I just like it. I just like it. And I also like that these are associated with the elemental planes. So if we go uh, here to the elemental planes, um, the platonic solids are also connected to um, elements. And, and now we're in another problem because what about the positive and negative energy planes? Um, and you're right, I need to figure that out. Maybe, <laughs> oh, but the, so I was thinking out loud, maybe the D5, sorry, maybe the D10 could be the positive and negative energy plane and it's not a platonic solid but maybe that's why those are so volatile or something. I don't know. That That's kind of, that's really dumb, but it doesn't fit the theme of the platonic solids, but it does fit the theme of, um, of using dice and interpreting dice in a different way. So let's write that down. So what if a D10 is the representation of the positive and negative energy plane? Uh, five and five, up and down, top and bottom, like they're, they're, they're equal, they're together, but they're also um, at odds with each other. That could be kind of interesting. So I don't know, leave me a comment below if you think that's cool. Thank you for watching everybody. Thank you so much for liking and subscribing. I hope you're enjoying this content. I'm getting a lot of positive feedback from uh, the comments, um, even though I think my views are, are way down, but I, I really appreciate you guys sticking with me and watching and letting me know. I've got quite a few influx of new patrons lately, so I wanna say thank you to that. Uh, it has been very, very helpful. So if you are interested in becoming a patron, uh, you can click the link to go to Patreon. I've got podcasts there uh, that I've, I've done with my friends. Uh, we do like an annual Halloween Kids on Bikes game that's up there, um, a bunch of other stuff. And uh, you can reach out to me, and contact me. Uh, also, I started a Discord that is growing quite well. And if you're interested, it's called Jordan's Jocular Junction and you can, uh, there's a link down below. Uh, anyone can join the Discord and when you do, make sure you read the welcome screen so you can select a role and actually unlock the full server um, and chat with a bunch of uh, other fans. I have nothing else to say. So take care and I will see you uh, tomorrow for double digits, day 10, it's gonna be great. Bye.